we met at Exeter University where we were both studying ecology. So we both had uh, got an interest in the, the natural environment and, and natural history. Bill went on to do a postgrad certificate education to do some teaching and I trained as a nurse. And our first sort of main job where we combined keeping livestock and doing a bit of nature conservation was in Yorkshire where we worked in a field study centre. We acquired our first cow and some sheep and we moved around the country quite a lot. We went to, to Cheshire, to Gloucestershire, to Somerset, taking all these animals with us. Um, this, this was all career moves. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> trying, I guess, to find the, the perfect uh, combination of keeping grazing animals and having sites that they could do some really good work on. And that's how we ended up coming up to Bankhouse Farm, because that was exactly what the, the wardening combined with, with the small farm as well uh, gave us that opportunity. We came in 1992, just before Christmas. The idea was that the tenant would do some part-time wardening for the trust and also work towards putting some of the livestock from the farm out onto other areas that the Trust was managing for nature conservation. In the late 80s, people like the National Trust and English Nature, who it was back then, now Natural England, the Wildlife Trust and the RSPB, they had all managed to acquire these lovely nature reserves, <laughs> largely because they'd been abandoned by farmers. It was a very difficult job when they finally woke up to the fact that without grazing animals, all this, what had been lovely open limestone grass and was, was turning into secondary woodland and, and scrub and bracken. I guess the thing that has probably made the biggest difference was the arrival of the stewardship schemes, agri-environment schemes, which luckily for us came in just when we, when we got here in, in um, 1992. So there was the ESA was already underway in the Lake District and then something called the Countryside Stewardship Scheme came in operating everywhere. I think we've got 16 different landlords, so there isn't sort of a, a one-size-fits-all. We can claim what's called a basic payment now, the area payment that's intended for supporting farming activities, and the landowner or the site manager, the conservation organisation, can claim the agri-environment scheme payments. And that sort of division of the spoils makes for a very stable and equitable relationship. Both sides need each other and so we do have a stable source of income because the areas of land that we're, we're providing this grazing on are quite large then you know it, it kind of underpins pretty well everything we do. The breeds that we have are all native breeds they do much better than any of the sort of continental breeds out in the sort of uh, more remote areas. So we've got mainly red poles. Um, we have a red pole bull and uh, we've got five or six beef shorthorn cows. But their calves are all crossed with the, the red pole bull. Um, and we also have got a few um, blue greys that we have left. The, the youngest calf was only born yesterday morning. I guess the, the main difference is that the focus of our business is not meat production. It's, it's about um, using them as conservation volunteers. So whilst we do produce beef and lamb at the end of their useful time on these reserves, that's not the, the main purpose. And I guess one of the big differences is that the, um, the cattle certainly are a lot older than any um, commercial beef enterprise would allow them to be. Largely because in order to graze some of the sites like Ingleborough over in the Yorkshire Dales, they have to be mature. They have to have developed a, a really good uh, mature rumen. It's harsh conditions out there, especially in winter. It can be harsh here too. Um, I forgot my coat as well. <laughs> we make our own hay, as you can see. Um, so we have a few hay meadows which we wouldn't use any um, artificial fertilisers on or improve in any way. 
other than using on a fairly sporadic basis the muck that we accumulate, which isn't a huge amount. For most of the animals, it's almost totally dependent on what they can get from the particular land that they're on. So we are the Morecambe Bay Conservation Grazing Company, and the key word there is grazing. So the animals are meant to be doing that work, uh, and that's how they deliver the conservation benefits. Um, so it, it, we would be failing you know, quite significantly if we had a system that depended on feeding them artificially. So the hay is, is really just back up. But the other element to it is that the meadows where this material is made are themselves a conservation feature. So when we first came to Bankhouse Farm at Silverdale, the National Trust were very keen that the meadows there could be made more species rich. Um, having gone through a period where they were fertilised and, um, and reseeded and, you know, with a very um, small number of species. So um, one of the things that we particularly wanted to do was to increase that species richness in these meadows. And although we're not at Bankhouse Farm anymore, we still have other meadows, other people's meadows, that we manage in the same way. Um, and, uh, and so haymaking is, is a kind of long-standing element of the, the whole system. And uh, in our minds, it's, it's just as valid as, as the nice bits of limestone grass and, and, and heath and, and, and other habitats. They manage the grassland. So where you have grassland in its own right, the grazing will mediate the, the kind of plant community in a way that just tones down the dominance of the more aggressive species, particularly the grasses, uh, and that will allow the more sensitive, the smaller, um, less vigorous things to compete. Uh, and so that paves the way for a more, just a richer variety of things. But that diversity brings flowers, brings diversity of insects. This fodder that the cows are tucking into is very rich in, in different species. It's not just the standard ryegrass, clover mix that most um, dairy farmers would. So it has um, lots more species in it. And, 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 and that's good for nature conservation. It's also good for the cows. Um, a lot of farmers would, would look at this stuff and um, they'd say, well, it's gone bad because it's all turned black. Um, the black in it are the herbs. Um, the, the flowers, in effect, um, and the chemistry of these plants um, just makes them do this because they're full of antioxidants. And antioxidants are one of the things that we now know are good for us because they um, protect us from diseases and cancer and that kind of thing. And we noticed quite early on in, in this that the cows actually seem to be looking for the black bits. Um, that you know, they would, they would come in and if they saw us putting some feed out in front of the barrier like this and it had a lot of this stuff in, they would push each other out of the way to be the first to get to it. We're organic, so in terms of the use of medications and things that we can uh, use to deal with parasites, we're fairly uh, strictly controlled by that. Because the cattle are outside the year round, we have very few problems with external and internal parasites. The density of stock on the areas um, is, is relatively low, so we don't have those kind of problems that intensive um, systems have. Um, if an animal does need any kind of medication, then obviously the animal welfare is a priority and we can use antibiotics if necessary. And our main problem would be something called liver fluke, which they pick up just in certain situations where the ground is very wet and favours the development of the snail that acts as an intermediate host for the liver fluke parasite. So we know that if we have to put the animals in those situations, they're quite likely to pick up the liver fluke. But we don't rush to treat them anyway. We wait to see if they begin to show signs. Usually they, they stop putting on condition and with sheep they'll get a bit anemic. And so if you're looking for those symptoms, then you can spot them in time and treat just those animals. Because we have a closed herd, so all these animals are familiar with the places that they go to, 
they build up an immunity. So we know that probably the cattle are carrying liver fluke and we've we found that because we've done tests and found that they are, but they're perfectly fit and healthy. Ticks are another massive problem here. Cattle come down from Whitbarrow absolutely covered in ticks, but none of them appear to pick up any of the tick-borne diseases. The only time we ever had that was when it was a, a cow that we bought in a long, long time ago before we had a closed herd. We've never taken animals to um, markets, auction markets or anything like that. Um, so when they've left us, they've, they've gone straight to the abattoir. Places like Ingleborough, where we've got quite a large number of cattle because it's a big site, there tend to be cohorts that are already about the same sort of age, you know, six, seven, eight years old. Um, so they would probably go as a group. There's an organisation that markets organic meat. So they would go off there and because they're older, they tend to go into the sort of um, organic baby food or for, for pie, pro processing yeah, rather, rather than, than sort of prime steaks and things like that. But by that stage, they're very big animals, although they've, they've been slow in getting there. So although they don't get the premium for, um, for being a bit over, over age, they do get um, a reasonable price for being organic and, and um, just by sheer weight of them as well. We have a relatively small customer base of um, people that are interested in buying locally grown um, meat and they, they know the provenance of, of it. So um, we maybe do about three, three animals a year and some, some lamb and mutton um, that we can supply locally. Um, and that's usually sold just in sort of relatively small freezer packs. Um, and the signs are that the demand is, yeah, is building yeah, as yeah. a result of We've Certainly COVID. since um, since lockdown, things have uh, got, got much more um, interesting in that, that quarter. There's, there's a, um, a choice to be made though, you know, do we invest more time in, in marketing mm. the products directly, which is very time consuming, but provides a better sort of financial return once you've got your market? And, um, or do we use our scarce resources just to concentrate on the, 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 the grazing management um, and then allow the animals to maybe go into a, what I think we'd have to admit was a less sustainable market. But the other side of it, of course, is that our costs are very low. Where we are delivering these agri-environment scheme payments for the landlord, then the rent will be correspondingly low because most of the money that we're um, facilitating is, is, is through the agri-environment scheme. Our input costs are very low because you know we're not buying fertiliser, we're not buying loads of feed, we're not buying loads of um, medicines. Um, and the main costs are really our time. Um, the sites are quite um, widely scattered, so you know there's a lot of um, uh, transport costs. Um, and, uh, but, you know, it, 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 it stacks up. So the methane question certainly become a big issue. And of course, it isn't just about methane now, it's also about the land that these animals are occupying and whether it could be better utilised for growing trees or for rewilding. There's such a lot of debate about the role of livestock red meat, um, ruminant production. We first became aware of it as an issue that was we were going to have to confront probably in uh, 2005, 2006. Um, and our first response was, you know, it, it, it doesn't affect us. You know, we're just doing um, a form of livestock production which reflects, you know, what, what nature intended with no inputs, um, based on the grazing management, operating at stocking intensities that are in line with what the land can support. So, you know, given that that, that would be not so different to what was happening when um, there was no uh, farming, you know, there would still have been ruminant animals grazing these landscapes, producing methane, and, and as far as we know, it caused no global warming. 
So as long as, you know, as long as we could stick to those principles, we thought we ought to be able to say we, we weren't part of the problem. Um, but these things don't play out quite as you think they do sometimes, as they ought to. Um, and very quickly, the argument focused on extensive grazing because the animals take longer to finish, so they're hanging around producing more methane during their lifetimes. Other systems for calculating the carbon footprint of livestock take much more account of what the, um, uh, the landscape is doing that is associated with these livestock. So when you include the carbon that's being um, sequestered by the soils um, and the trees and, and, and the habitats, if you like, then you will get a very different result. All the evidence that's being gathered at the moment by researchers show that meat that's produced from a primarily grass-based diet is much richer in essential fatty acids that people need to maintain all aspects of their health. A lot of the sites that we do graze have got trees on and we really see the benefits of agroforestry and combining the grazing and browsing and the animals choose themselves. You see them um, going to plants that you would think, you know, the, the kind of perceived wisdom is, oh, they shouldn't be eating you because it's poisonous. But actually they tuck into you quite happily um, because they know how much to eat. And we, we gather tree hay, which we can take out to them as well. And they really show preference quite a lot of the time for, for going for leaves. You know, if you can combine the trees with pasture, then it's, um, it's a, it's a win-win situation because you've got, you've got the best of both worlds. There's some evidence to suggest that cows that have access to browse actually produce less methane because the tannins in, uh, in tree and, and, and shrub leaves um, mediate the, the, the processes of, of the rumen you know, the bugs, it's, it's the, um, the bacteria in the rumen that are producing this methane. There's always been a lot of interest in, in what we're doing. Most of the time we've been here, um, I've been asked to go and give talks. For a long while now I've, I've done this at the university and I talked to the, the students about conservation grazing and I was being asked by individual students whether they could come and help. So um, we had a couple of students who would just come and do that. And one of them was very keen and stayed on. And then eventually he found employment elsewhere and went on to have a career in environmental management. So that's when this, this whole apprenticeship idea started. And I think, yes, probably we had, we had four or so. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and the, there's, there's usually been outside funding available so that you know, we, we didn't have to pay their wages. Um, that was supplied from, from outside sources, um, but we, we would um, um, dedicate the time to, to showing them ropes and, and they got training at college for, for particular skills um, that they would need to go on and do it professionally in their own right. And we're also uh, members of Cumbria Farmer Network who hold regular meetings and you've, you've delivered talks there and you know various um, interest groups um, that we participate in. Yes, yeah, so I, I think within, within this, um, the realms of nature conservation, there is you know, a, a, a willingness to you know, share experience and knowledge and, and, and to make sure that people aren't constantly having to reinvent the same wheel. So we're just part of that culture, I think.